you can see um, 0.5 arc second scale bar here, you can see um, components C, D and E, and so 0.5 arc second is about 20 astron AU uh, astronomical units. So it's just amazing um, what uh, AO can do. This is extreme adapter optics. And on here also with um, Jupiter here, we can see all the extraordinary detail um, equivalent to a space-based telescope, like the Hubble Space Telescope, but at a different wavelength, usually in the infrared wavelength. So here is um, another example of the science you can do with adaptive optics. This is correction over a slightly larger field of view, 1.6 arc minutes across um, of NGC 4038 um, at longer wavelengths, near infrared wavelengths, uh, J, H and K. And you can see here that um, the, the GEMS instrument with the GSAOI, you can see um, they can image star clusters. It's probably not shown very clearly here on the screen, but they can distinguish star clusters um, from the background stars, which is quite amazing. So this is a talk overview. I'm going to give a description of adaptive optics, um, a little bit about background of how adaptive optics uh, work. And also talk about some adaptive experiments on the 3.9 meter AAT Australian um, Anglo Australian uh, Telescope, and also some R and D projects we have here um, to do adaptive optics at the AAO. So uh, we need adaptive optics um, mainly because atmosphere um, blurs uh, <coughs> blurs the object, so we have. In that sphere, we have uh, different temperature fluctuations, um, dense air, we've got whole, uh, hot and cold air that uh, mix and refract the light rays. Um, so we have a, a flat wavefront coming at the top of the atmosphere, so this could be um, up to 15 kilometers, and when it hits the atmosphere, we have um, different temperature fluctuations, and the light rays get refracted many times. And then the wavefront is no longer planar, the optical wavefront, it's actually um, has some aberration with it, and the telescope just can't form an image, it's all blurred like this. So, this is a very simple uh, schematic to show what's happening. And this, these hot and cold air is usually um, at the boundary between um, the wind shear and the very large uh, temperature gradients. And um, yeah, so that's the result that blurs the image. <laughs> and so, uh, shown here is um, a movie showing what the atmosphere does to an image. I'll just play the movie on the left hand side. Let's go across. So, the atmosphere has two components. We have um, a speckled component. So, the image is speckled here, and also a tip tilt component. So, we've got image motion. So, we have uh, this image motion here plus uh, tip tilt speckles. And uh, this is the compensated image here. And so, adaptive optics uh, corrects for both the image motion and the high order image speckles. So, there's two functions that need to be compensated here. And so, these little speckles just shown here that um, it's a bit hard to see uh, due to the contrast, but that's the diffraction limit of the telescope. So this image has been slowed down by 700 times. Um, it's been taken a number of years ago with a 24-inch telescope outside in the springs um, to show the atmospheric turbulence in a um, bad scene there. So I'll just try to go to the next slide there. Either. So just to summarise again, so we have the long exposure due to the speckles and the image motion here. And then we have the short exposure image here, which is speckles, and then we have the corrected image here, which is the diffraction limit, um, near the diffraction limit of the telescope. <coughs> and so you can see that um, the intensity, a huge intensity gain here um, when, the, when the AO is switched on. Um, so that leads to um, a lot of scientific uh, uh, gains. And, um, and performance. So, just a question: that yep. little observed to telescope was fitted with AI? Um, one meter. I mean, that's what you had on the I previous think, slide. 
maybe it's um, experiment they did wasn't a, a, a instrument, maybe just a small um, research project they did. I think it's quite old these images. They might be a number of years old. And so, um, so turbulent layers. This is just a simple schematic to show the sources of the atmospheric turbulence or any um, turbulence. Uh, the optical path. So the first one is we have heat sources in, in, in the dome here. Uh, it's usually a strong component of the um, measured turbulence. We have wind flow that um, mixes up the turbulence here. So minimizing the heat sources in the dome and uh, ventilating there is a very important uh, step to improve the image quality. And we have this band, boundary layer which is usually the strong, strongest layer, um, particularly at low altitude sites like siding the spring. Um, so the air is more dense here, so it goes up to one kilometre here, and then we have um, that's the next. Yeah, so that extends up to the tropopause here, where we have a strong temperature gradient and high wind speed. You get some wind shear things there. So there's three, I guess, three sources. One is the dome, um, heat in the dome. The next one is the boundary layer or the near surface layer here. And the, the tropopause, so they're the common layers um, typically found <coughs> in, in profiles. So, um, critical to adaptopics performance is the structure of that straight turbulence. So, this is a typical turbulence profile here. So, it's strongest near the ground here, or the boundary layer here. And then at the tropopause here, you get some other layers here, it's usually thin layers. And so, there's a um, the abstract turbulence is measured as a refractive index structure constant, uh, the CN squared uh, parameter here. And so um, by studying the atmospheric profiles, we can use this as an input to um, simulations for adaptive optics. I'll just show that on the next slide here. We have um, some site testing where Adaptive optics uh, programs or projects they require knowledge of the height here. So um, this is some of the, the slide observations I did back in 2008 um, at the last Copernicus Observatory for the GMT. So the idea was to measure the structure of the turbulence and come up with a model of optical turbulence profile that I can put into the simulations. And this just shows you how variable the turbulence is. So this is a 1.6 kilometers here, and this is a uh, time going across the uh, axis here. You can see that. You have a layer here that just pops up at 600 meters for like about 15 minutes and so it disappears again. So it's quite variable that straight turbulence and the layers come and go depending on you know, the, the weather patterns or the wind shear, the temperature gradients and so forth. So an important parameter in the adapt optics is the free parameter called R0. So that's basically um, where the wavefront is considered linear or um, the, the phase, the coherent length, um, the free parameters also know the coherent length, which is the distance over which the um, wavefront is a diffraction limited, so it's the size of an aperture, uh, so to speak, where it will be a diffraction limited image. So at the good sites, it's about 10 centimeters in the V band or the optical, which is um, about one arc second seeing here. So Usually, the, the need, we need our data types because the primary mirror um, of the telescope is a lot larger than this R0 parameter. So, by, by using this R0 parameter, we can determine that and we can work out what the seeing is, the full path maximum of the seeing, and also approximately we can work out the number of sub apertures we need in the AO system. So, uh, we had D over R0 here. So, for example, Siding spring is a four meter telescope, you have uh, 10 centimeter sub apertures, so you can work out you need a lot of apertures um, to do diffraction limited in the visible. But R0 also scales with wavelength, so it's a lot easier to do in the infrared, it's a lot larger. Uh, the size of R0 is a lot larger than the infrared, which reduces the number of actuators and also the time scales. Um, also uh, depend on R0 and the average wind speed. Uh, so these are sort of approximate equations. So um, AO becomes very difficult in the visible because R0 is very small. 
and the, the correction angle on access correction is very small um, as well. Uh, short wavelengths or in bad seeing. So in bad seeing, this is the I guess the turbulence integral. So in bad seeing, this number is um, very large. So it's R naught is very small. You can see with um, when you do AO with correction, we have this diffraction limited core surrounded by this uh, halo. So this is the diffraction limit of the telescope, and this is like the scene, the uncorrected scene here. Um, so at the best sites, R0 can be 30 centimetres, so that's why they do AO at the best sites in the world, because it's like easier to achieve. And at sites like uh, Siding Spring, um, it's 5 to 10 uh, centimetres, um, typically. This is 2 arc seconds and 1 arc seconds. <coughs> So this is how an AO system works. We have um, light from uh, either a natural guide star or latest guide star that produces a, a spot and that comes through. Um, so this is like the, the collimated light come through here of the telescope um, pupil. Mm -hmm. And so the wavefront is distorted here. And so the light goes, hits the deformal mirror and gets through a beam splitter, so the near-infrared light goes to the high-resolution camera and the optical light typically goes to a wavefront sensor. So the wavefront sensor determines the shape of the optical wavefront here and applies that signal to uh, the formal mirror. And it does this hundreds, hundreds of times a second to compensate that spread turbulence. And so the end result is a flat wavefront like this. So when you've got a flat wavefront like this, we have a, uh, a diffraction limited uh, image uh, shown here. So on the next slide, I think I have a, a video here, so let's play this video. So this summarizes um, how AO system works. The, uh, Gemini telescope here. Um, let's play that through. So we have um, this Examination shows um, the laser guide star uh, working. So the laser goes up through. I should probably speed it up a little bit. There are particular ranges in which the laser is actually used. Do you actually just use it for its intended theory or can you go away? Down to the yeah, so because um, the laser guide star at a certain altitude, so when you go further across, that to refocus the point. So um, the probably new, uh, there's probably limitations near Zenith. I've no experience myself with laser guide stars, but it will probably be a certain uh, uh, elevation limit or altitude limit where you can't go past that because of the focusing. It's usually about 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Trying to go much lower, it's almost impossible to compensate yeah. so much atmosphere. So, yeah. so sorry, just a basic question. So the idea of the laser beam is that you excite sodium atoms at a particular height, is that the deal? And then you see that as a guide star. That's right, yeah. So there's a layout 90 kilometers um, that cause line resonance. So it's a very particular wavelength of the laser. Yeah. So it's tuned to line or something. That's right, yeah. So sodium laser guide star is the highest altitude laser guide star which um, samples the turbulence more and there's a low altitude with Rayleigh laser guide star up to 10 15 kilometers um, so the laser guide star comes through the instrument here and, uh, you see the light plus that gets here gets collimated it's the formal mirror here the so one goes to uh, the wavefront sensor here and then the new infrared light goes to the science camera here and so this, this is the, the science camera measuring the, the aberrated star image. So this wavefront comes in here like potato chips, I think it's been called, like potato chips. And so that measures the wavefront here, and then it closes the loop, so to speak. And so it sends signals, and this mirror vibrates at exactly matching the wavefront. And this is done, you know, hundreds of times per second. Uh, just another question yeah. on this. So this really is suitable for uh, small field of view telescopes where you're in the same isoplanetic patch. That's right, yeah. Be right. 
So that's um, there's all different types of AO correction. So the one you're talking about with the isopanic act is single conjugate AO. So they correct just for the column of air above the telescope. But there's um, multi conjugate AO and grand AO. There's all different AO techniques, which I'll show on the next slide. Sorry, yeah, that's okay. <coughs> so this is how a wavefront sensor works. This is just a simple, there's many wavefront sensors. This is one of the Shack Hartman wavefront sensor, which is probably the most easy, easiest to understand. Is when you've got a flat wavefront coming through here, these lots of little lenses, so you use optics to project the telescope pupil, uh, be magnified onto these micro lens array here. And so flat wavefront produces this uh, array of dots, uh, star images here. And so these lenses are the R north spacing, so they go here and there. And so when you have aberrated wavefront through here, these spots displace. So this is taking the, the derivative or the slope of these. Uh, it's me measured by these spots here, so that's just a very simple uh, explanation of how the wavefront sensor works. And the deformable mirror, all it does is um, just match the wavefront here, shown here, and uh, because it's in reflection, it's only half the amplitude of the wavefront, the reflection. And so uh, the wavefront comes in here and then it comes flat um, out of the DM. And these are little actuators, um, could be piazzo electric. Um, actuators that move the surface by microns, a few microns, and very high frequency response. And these actuators are also spaced at the coherent length. So this is talking about the laser guide stars again. And so this um, usually laser guide stars are launched in the middle of the telescope. And you can see here that can that can use um, one laser can be split up into a constellation of laser guide stars to sample the turbulence. I'll just show you that why on the next slide. Um, that's the sodium layer where it's 90 kilometers is a thin layer where the, the wavelength resonate. Um, there's line resonance here and you can um, have a nice spot here. And this is just a uh, backscatter due to dust and moisture. And they can um, gate the exposure just to get the dots and the north back there. So a laser guide stars are needed for sky coverage. Um, because there are not many bright natural guide stars, it turns out that most AO systems, natural guide stars, work brighter than magnitude 10. And so to get sky coverage, they use laser guide stars. And there's two types of laser, laser guide stars. There's a Rayleigh laser guide star up to 10 to 25 kilometers, and a sodium laser guide star 90 kilometers. And the power ranges from 5 to 50 watts, uh, depending on the laser type. And the limitation to the laser guide star is that the cone effect, because it's a point source at 90 kilometers, so we don't sample all the turbulence and we don't measure the tip tilt because the, the upwards and downwards path go through the same bit of atmosphere, so we can't measure the image motion of that. And a painted natural guide star is also needed for the tip tilt, so you can't just use a laser guide star by itself, you also need a much fainter uh, tip tilt star. So the reason it's much fainter is we can use the whole aperture of the telescope rather than the, the small sub aperture of the wavefront center. So you can go to magnitude 15 or 17, it's uh, quite easy. So this looks at the, the laser guide star here. Um, so the Rayleigh laser guide star has a certain altitude here, so it doesn't sample all the turbulence uh, in this region here, it's not sampled here. And if the aperture is a lot larger, then um, there's a lot more turbulence that's not sampled here. So the solution is to use multiple laser guide stars or use a high altitude laser guide star that's more expensive. And so this is just an animation uh, here, which I've covered before. But um, so the, the terms that you don't measure, um, this is a logarithmic plot. So uh, you, you reconstruct the wavefront, and then this residual turbulence here produces these uh, speckles here. But it's a logarithmic plot um, that produces a halo. So I'll just skip over that. So these are the different types of correction methods. Um, so we have single conjugate AO, where you just correct, you just correct for a column of air here. And um, so you have a wavefront sensor, wavefront corrector, and then it, as you go up here, up, off the side here, the form degrades rapidly because the turbulence gets uh, not correlated because you go through a different cone uh, of the turbulent layer. So grain layer is you have multiple wavefront sensors over six half minute field of view, and you're averaging the wavefront. So when you average the wavefront together, you only start correcting the overlapping regions here, which is the grain layer. So when the grain layer is strong, you get better um, performance. 
So this is um, a laser tomography, which is using multiple wavefront sensors again, but using uh, different algorithms, actually trying to crack for the, the high altitude and ground layer at the same time. And multiple conjugate AO, where they have several DMs conjugated at certain layers here. And so I'll just uh, skip over that one. And then they have a uh, multi-object AO uh, shown here, where they have uh, many wavefront sensors and they also have many um, correction elements. And so, uh, so by doing this, uh, you can do more efficient uh, science surveys. Um, so the correction is not as good as single conjugate AO, but it's better than ground layer AO, so somewhere in between um, performance. And so this is some of the adapt optics on the AAT that we've done. Um, we had several runs of very short nights of director's time. As, as shown here, we have uh, the AO system on the Casper and Focus of the AAT. And we'll also look at um, distributed wavefront sensors to, um, to, to because it's a cast focus, we've got 20 arc minutes. And so we're looking at ground layer AO and multi object AO using um, these wavefront sensors that use polymer bundles. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about that later on. And then also at, at, um, active injection. So we have a second stage AO system that feeds into single mode waveguides. Uh, so it's all on the 3.9 meter telescope. And so this is what we have in the lab. This is a very um, earlier setup here, very simple setup. We have a lab view map lab working with a optical bench here. Uh, so these are some of the specs. We're using a 97 actuated mirror that has high strokes. So we do tip tilt and high order with the same mirror. And we're using an SCMOS camera, which is uh, quite low noise and uh, quite um, good value for performance. And we also have uh, phase screens to, to simulate the turbulence. So it just shows the various parts, wavefront sensor, the formal mirror. This is the acquisition camera to, look, to go to um, the field. We have a calibration source and the infrared camera. So this is the cast cage, that's the system here. So it's um, a bit hard to see from these plots here, but this is just looking at the image motion. So off, you can see it varying up and down here between 0.5 arc second uh, amplitude. And when you turn the AO system on, it goes, the image motion is compensated here. So this is um, a second run here. So we, um, so this is just a scatter plot showing the centroid or the image motion when it's off and when it's on here. So we get some good results just with image motion correction. And then if we look at the full width half max, and this is in the H band. So this is just um, the observation here. So you can see this is the um, when we average the frames together, we get this sort of image here. And when we turn the AO system on, we get improved full width half maximum. So we've gone from Two arc second or 1.9 arc second in the H band to 0.76 arc seconds here. So this is partial correction. Um, we might need more actuators on the DM because um, this is a bad scene of two arc seconds. And so this is during a second run here. And so um, in the third run here, we made a lot more improvements. And so we um, this is active injection. Uh, so this is. The AO system here, it's an optical bench upside down on the cast cage. And um, this is a second stage active injection here where they try to use a second MEMS mirror to steer the, the light into a single mode waveguide um, to in, improve the coupling. It's very hard to eject the light into a single mode waveguide. So they use um, adapt optics to, to position the star exactly onto the fibre with that three um, so that's moving or speckling it about. And also we're looking at distributed wavefront sensors. So this is the research project we do here at AO is looking at how we use these um, like imaging bundles um, to uh, like 7,000 cores, uh, like a classic polymer bundle where we can put wavefront sensors on the focal plane and then re-imaging with one camera. So one camera can do multiple wavefront sensors and we can access the full 20 arc minute field of view. So this is the, the back end block of the bundles. So we try to, we can, um, Image mm -hmm. many wavefront sensors in one camera exposure. And so it's a bit hard to show here, but we have tip tilt sensors, and we can also, this is a Shack Hartman um, for the aberration wavefront. So the idea is to have one camera to, this is like a mock setup, but we can have an array of wavefront sensors with one low noise camera. So a lot of efficiency gains, and this could be used for multi object AO for diagnostics mm -hmm. around the telescope. 
So on the second run here, we got better results. So this is a in quite bad scene. This is just tip tilt correction. We're showing mm -hmm. the centroid or the image motion wandering off to almost plus or minus one arc second. When you turn it on, you get a lot better image stabilization. And in the third run, we got a lot better results with the AO correction. So we go from 1.44 arc seconds down to 0.4 arc seconds. So there's a big difference between those two. And so we can do AO correction on the AT. So it's probably quite a broad statement here, but the AT forms like a six meter telescope for a half an arc second aperture. Okay. So, um, so it's quite good that we're getting results on the AT from you know, <coughs> 1.4 arc seconds to 0.4 arc seconds here. Uh, but there's a halo around here. That's because we haven't got enough actuators. There's like the so the self energy. So the full half maximum is a huge gain. But the self energy might be a factor of two or three, and so still a bit more work to do um, with more actuators or running a little, a little bit faster. So the, the, the video for this one, um, so I'll just try and skip this slide, but it's not. So I'll just quickly go into the R and D um, at the TOS at the resets we're doing um, here in North Ride. So this is a Starbug. So what I'm trying to do is get a wavefront sensor inside a Starbug. And so Starbug is used for the type hand instrument. So this is an early image here taken in July 2015 um, with 150 Starbugs, later on only 300 Starbugs. But they have an out of diameter of 8 millimeters and speed 2 or 3 millimeters and very small steps. So this is how Starbug works. So out of tube, in tube moving, uh, like so. We can step across the focal plane. Let's get through these. So, the idea of using um, Starbug wavefronts is it's these green dots here, they could be all wavefront sensors for multi object AO. So, having lots of these wavefronts, wavefront sensors uh, packed on the one detector can be very large uh, efficiency. So, 20 arc minutes. The GMT has a 20 mark arc minute field of view, and that's 1.2 minutes across. So, um, that's a Starbug. So, the idea is to put a collimator lens and a, and a micro lens right here, and then pulling the energy bundles into a Starbug center. So this is just an optical schematic showing um, the telescope light F8 being collimated and then onto this micro lens right here, and you get seven um, pupils here, and each one is going to be a bundle. So this is the prototype we have in the lab here, um, just showing this is a top two Starbucks, so it has a bigger outer tube. And this is a 3D printed uh, component here that has the acromat and the micro lens right here, and that's the polymer bundles that fit at the back. So you get these three polymer imaging bundles. That matches the GMT. This is the GMT uh, pupil. And so it's just showing it um, integrated in the lab here. And so this is um, just showing a flat wave front uh, here. So I think some of these didn't show up correctly, but you get like, a, um, like a, an array of dots. This is just a, a flat wave front, no aberration. So you just get the, the grid structure. So you have seven uh, pupil images here. And so the other Technology I'm working on is um, a hoverboard. There's another video, but probably due to time constraints, uh, I won't show that. So you have a Starbucks in each corner that floats on an air bearing that can either um, uh, have um, blow air or suck air. Suck air sticks on the field plate, and when you want to move it, you, um, you, you pressurize it with the air and move it around like an air bearing. So, in conclusion, um, so AO improves image resolution and detection of fainter objects. It's essential for large telescopes. Uh, AO performance can be very variable uh, due to the atmospheric turbulence. Uh, some days it'll be very poor performance, some days it'll be better. Uh, some techniques like ground layer might be better than uh, multi-conjugate AO uh, if the layers move and so forth. And we have adapted all the experiments performed on the 3.9 meter AAT telescope and also have ongoing uh, AI research project here. It's a very small project, uh, in-house project, just to uh, keep it updated in skills and about optics. So, thank you. Thank you very much, a great overview. Uh, any questions about uh, adaptive optics, uh, techniques, applications, technology? I've got one. Uh, so if you were to get out the AMT adaptive optics, what sort of cost are you talking about? Yeah. So, yeah. so the next step we need laser guide stars.
because to get Sky Courage, so we're doing natural guide stars. So having laser guide stars increases the price. So if I save a laser guide star, they're like a million dollars. But a Rayleigh laser guide star, which I'll probably go for, say after 20 kilometers, one tenth the cost. And so, um, so add up all the components. So the hardware wise, it might be, yeah, a couple hundred thousand dollars, but it's the labor that goes into it. And, sure. and you can't use it every single day. Some days are better than others. So you might use it for, yeah, one in every four nights or one in every two nights. You might better use it because the atmosphere varies a lot. Um, sometimes I've seen two or three arc seconds or four arc seconds seen. You can't do anything when it's that bad. <coughs> so, um, you have to be some sort of yeah, weighing against the cost versus performance, but some going uh, investigation. So do you think it's cost effective to do this? Something like that? I think so because it makes the telescope. That's right, yeah, like a six or eight metre telescope, which people want, they want an eight metre telescope, so doing AO on a small scale can not solve the problem, but alleviate some of the issues um, with that. But need a laser guide star, which is a lot more research effort, expertise. Uh, what's the space? It's hopefully not be too long, but it yeah, okay. laser beam cost you sort of well within your yeah, budgetary... I think so. Um, Technology has developed so much over the last 10 years, it's getting cheaper yeah. to do it. And if it helps the image quality, why not? But mm -hmm. I don't make decisions. It's expensive. I think more. <laughs> yeah. I think more research, and it doesn't solve everything. You know, it doesn't. It might help a few science cases because I think the AOT is focused on wide field, AO, wide field mm. um, surveys and stuff like that, where it gets very hard to make a, a, a wide field uh, for the AOT. Mm. Um, so you might have to do multi-object AO or ground AO. Yeah. 